So this Lent, we're going through a book by Marjorie Bankson that looks at the soul cycle, the cycle that our souls go through as we respond to God's call in our life. And I know of no better season to study that and to look into it than Lent as we prepare to find our place in the story of Christ and as we follow Christ making sacrifice um, for greater life and abundance for all of us and as we seek to determine determined to follow Christ without turning back of where that call will then lead us. And so we've started um, in the human acknowledgement of resistance and that there can be a call that comes into our lives and usually the knee-jerk reaction is a, oh no, not I, um, which we are well acquainted with in scriptures and how others have responded to God's call as well. And then, and then as we're working with that resistance and the Holy Spirit wears us down because she can, she's persistent, like that widow and the judge, um, we go into a realm of reclaiming who we are. So a kind of time of like reading through old journal journals or looking at photo albums, remembering stories that our family has taught us that we'd forgotten about, reclaiming a piece of ourself that we hadn't used in a while that we know that we will need. And that can also be reclaiming a part of our spiritual heritage of knowing who we are and where we come from. And then stage three is this beautiful in-breaking kingdom stage of a kainos moment and chronos time of where we get to have epiphanies or have those mystical experiences of faith where we get a glimpse of what God is about, an assurance in our soul, a light, a call, an expansion of imagination. One of those moments that transcends time and where we are in daily living that also requires that we're willing to break up our daily cycle and routine enough for that to come in and to experience that moment. And then we have the biggest decision of all, the fulcrum of call, and that's that poison river. Will we cross it or not? Will what has been stirred in our heart stay in our heart? Or will it be lived out in our life? Will it become public? And that's that crossing, and that's the biggest point. That's where a lot of calls come up to and then go no farther. And, and so as we look at what it means to cross that river and to share externally what has been happening internally with us, we go into the stage four, the risk stage. And as we look at these in the crossing of the riv river, they're gonna relate back to other stages that we've already been through internally. So this is gonna relate back with that resist stage. And it makes sense, right? Because just as we resisted this new thing, this change in ourselves, so is the world around us, our family, our friendships, our neighbors, our communities, our workplaces, are also going to resist that. And that's something that we can be better prepared for if we expect that. If we're able to name that resistance is a piece of this call. Because if you're anything like myself, I'm going to want people to be excited with me. I've already done all these stages of work and really, really been hammering this through my soul. And when I finally cross that poison river, I'm ready to scream it from the mountaintops and be excited and go and claim it. And then all of a sudden, there's all this cold water that gets thrown on everything, right? Because other people are like, time out. What the what are you doing and talking about and who are you? And so part of what will be important is having a core group, a small group, who are able to have that excitement, who have done this journey with you um, on the internal in terms of the core check-in, and then who can be that safe space as then you encounter the resistance. Because this is change. You've crossed a river. You're going to change the way that you relate to people. You're going to change the way you spend your time. You're going to change the way you spend your money. You're going to change the way you do life. If I have decided to follow Jesus, then that means I'm going to go to places I didn't go to before. That means I'm going to meet with people I didn't spend time with before. That means there's going to be a lot of change, and change is anxious, 
And so there's going to be pushback. And so if we expect that and we're ready for that, then we can give the kindness that Christ has given us. Just as God held our resistance and gave us space to work through what we needed to work through when God was knocking on our heart's door, this is our chance to give that love and that space and that connection with others as they are working through what we are telling them. And if we can respond to resistance with kindness, with love, with space and time and patience and self-control, all those spiritual fruit, instead of the ragged edges of disappointment and anger and fear and shame and guilt, then there's ways for this to move through in a really healthy, beautiful way. And that still doesn't mean it's going to happen all the time. It just means you've given it a greater chance to happen. And it means you've given people a greater chance to wrestle with their own resistance and then come back as phenomenal supports and phenomenal anchors and foundations. And there are times where we're also going to be pleasantly surprised where we were buttressing ourselves up and putting on all the armor of God to have this conversation because we knew that there was going to be a resistance that was going to come in at our very core level and capture us and hook us, and it's going to be hard. And then all of a sudden, we're surprised, and the resistance that we expected from that person or that place wasn't there. Or that job change that we were making, we were buttressing ourselves up for a horrible financial drought and season, and then all of a sudden the next job just came right like that, and we get to be surprised. And those are beautiful, wonderful moments to let wash over us, and as much as we prepare for the resistance, to also give room for the surprise. <sighs> Are we in, and if we're doing both of this, are we in a moment of starting to understand why this is such an anxious and emotionally tangled time? There's so much that could happen and there's so much that might not happen. This is a hard moment. And it's hard enough that a lot of times people might be like, yeah, peace out, and go right back to the other side of the river. And there are also moments, especially if you have that good core group, that small group, whether it's ours here or another one, that helps you manage that risk in a way that happened with our children at Children's Moments, in a way that turns the fear into fun. And I know that sounds trite as adults, but it really can be exhilarating. It really can be a brand new adventure that's full of curiosity and full of possibility because we've broken so many things open. And so there's so much more that can be there now because of the space that we made in taking that risk on and crossing the Poison River. And so who are the people in your life that can help bolster you in that, that can help make that emotional flip inside of you and how you engage? And who are the people that you need to have in your life to be the safe space so that when the risk you were concerned about really is there, you can be protected somewhere, right? You can fall back somewhere before you go back to the battle lines again. Because this is a fight. This is a fight to follow Christ. And the spiritual forces of wickedness and the powers of evil that we promise to fight against in our baptismal vows are smart. And they know what they're doing. And so this is the stage where we have to keep a warrior's focus. Because there's going to be so much that is offered to us as temptation. And here's the thing about temptation, what we got into a little bit with the kids um, before Sunday school today. It's not always a bad thing. It's not always clearly, oh, that's something that's harmful. harmful. Temptation can be something that's good. It's just not the call good, right? So Jesus comes and is asked to turn loaves, turn stones into loaves of bread. It's not a bad thing to feed people, especially in occupied people who are starved, who have been so overtaxed that they don't have money left to buy food. 
I mean, I just asked for funds for the pastor's discretionary fund, and we've just been talking about gathering food from the food pantry to feed people and to take care of people. That's not a bad thing. It just wasn't the fullness of Jesus' call. And so part of that temptation was to take care of people in one particular place for one particular moment. But what about all the other moments? What about all the other people? What about all the other places? Jesus came for all. And as good as that moment would have been, it wasn't good enough because it wasn't the fullness of his call. And so, yes, using all of the power of all of the kingdoms for good is a very wonderful good thing. And for Jesus, it's not enough because it's about breaking that cycle of who's in power completely so that there's power for everyone. Back to man economics, right? So that everyone can get, gather the manna that they need so everyone can have too much enough not right the larger tribes gathered more and didn't have too much the smaller tribes gathered less and all had enough and so yes temptations will come and there'll be good things that we can do this is one of the hardest things for us as a church to do because there is so much need in the world and there are so many good things that we can do and so part of the importance of what you all will be doing and what we named in our church pro profile is to find that one vision, to find that one collective call for Epworth. What is it that Epworth can do because of who we are and the skills and the gifts that are gathered in this place and the call that God has placed on our community that no one else can do? And then once we claim that, how do we keep a warrior's focus on that? Because there'll be lots of good that we can do if we choose to go down all the different rabbit holes, but it will only go so far. It will only go so deep. But if we choose to keep that warrior's focus and choose to follow our call with all of who we are, then there's a chance for transformation to happen at a systemic level at a soul level, at not just putting band-aids on the symptoms, but actually healing the sickness that caused those symptoms so that those band-aids are no longer needed. What does it mean to work not just to keep the food pantry stocked, but to end the food deserts that are keeping people perpetually from having the food on the table that they need? These are the questions of call that are a part of our lives as followers of Christ, not just individually, but collectively as well. And this is a really important phase because this is the phase where we become mama and papa bears and protect that baby call that's just been born, that's really vulnerable, that hasn't grown up yet. And so just as we protect and love our kids and grow them up, this is the time where we protect and love that call and grow it up into fullness and to maturity as well. And there's one among us who's been really working on that and putting a lot of time and intentionality into it. And it's something that we've surrounded her in prayer with a lot over her time with us. And so Jan, if you would come and share your testimony on this journey. Now I can see. <laughs> Good morning. My world stopped on April 10th, 2012. My husband, my best friend, the father of my children, my first date, my first kiss died. My family would tell you that I've always been depressed and always been anxious. It was my fault, they said. I should be able to do something about it. I should handle things better. Phil was the spiritual leader in our family. He was strong. He knew a Bible verse for everything. He was raised as a preacher's kid. I didn't learn all that. I trusted him to guide me the right way. 
So after he died, I felt totally, totally lost. I felt like I had no purpose. My children were grown. My grandchild was almost grown. Everybody was leaving home. And I didn't know what to do with myself. There came a day that I went in the bedroom and locked the door in the bedroom <clears throat> and laid down and cried for about four hours. I wanted to die. I wanted to commit suicide. But I knew the damage that that leaves behind. At my lowest point at that, when I was trying to decide, I actually felt arms wrap around me. I heard a voice say that I have a purpose, that I needed to go on, that there's more for me to do. So for the last seven years, have you guys have watched me here crying, praying, trying to find out, going through every Bible study that I could, I wanted to learn, so I, I did, I read, I studied, I prayed. The first real breakthrough I felt was when I studied Jeremiah. And for the first time in my life, I heard uh, chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So God had a plan for me? I didn't know. All right. How will I know when he tells me that plan? I had an opinion about what that plan should be. I don't think God cared about that. I thought I should go do mission work. I'm not too old. I should go out and do something in the mission field. I read, I looked online, I talked to people who'd done mission work. There was just nothing there that felt like a call to me. So the next thing I thought, well, I'm just going to be content with what I have. I'm going to be content. I'm not a content person. I'm still not a content person, even though I've grown a lot. So that didn't happen. This sermon series about the cycle of call has been a revelation to me. This cycle doesn't only appear in our life when we're being called to do God's work in the mission field, or to be a minister, or to teach Sunday school, or to even provide for the food bank. I think this cycle appears in our life any time we have a transition. I have felt the need to move on, to move to seek happiness, maybe just a change in life to look for hope. But I was afraid, so I resisted. I spent the good last year resisting. I listened to others and let them help me build my doubts and fears. So when Kate did the sermon about resisting, I went home and I prayed a lot. And I realized that I could resist, and I would never know the outcome could be different. Or I could move on, and there's a lot of hope there. So I prayed some more and decided to step out of resistance and find hope. I reclaimed my goals. I talked it out with others, others that were important to me. I've gotten so much support from my small group. It's very embarrassing to say that, be that because I wasn't sure that the small groups were the right thing to do here. I didn't think they would work. I wanted to continue traditional Bible studies. I didn't really want to share with six or seven or 12 people that I really didn't know that well. But I did, and I love the connections that have formed. I love the support I've gotten. And through deciding to move, I've had all kinds of support from them, both physical support for moving things, and mostly just support that although they'd like me to stay here, I think, that they want me to move on if that's what will make me happy. I crossed the Poison River. That, for me, was all the naysayers in my life, and I was one of those. The you can't do that on your own, even the you might be too old to do that. That takes a lot of nerve. You won't have any support where you're going. But even now, my naysayers have turned it around and said, I see the hope in you. I want you to do this. I'm taking a risk. I have faith that I can do this. I'm selling my home and moving. I have no new home. I have no new place. No assurance that this is the right move. Nothing in writing on the dotted line that says where to go. But I have hope, and I feel strong, and I feel ready. God is with me step by step, and now we talk every day. I'm leaving here a stronger person, thanks to a lot of you, who knows where she fits in God's plan. A plan for good and not for harm.
Thank you, Jan. So how will you claim your new beginning and how you, will you mark it? And how will you keep a warrior's focus to be the mama, the papa bear that protects that baby call as, as that call grows into the fullness that God has for it, those plans that God has promised and knit together in the very foundation of the earth. Will you stand and join in singing our closing hymn, Rising in Body or in Spirit? 